In this video, I'm not going to try to establish date ranges for all 27 writings of the New Testament. Instead, I want to discuss briefly the issues surrounding the process of coming up with a working date range for any particular writing, and we'll use the Gospel of Mark as our example. Everything in this video can be independently confirmed by you, the viewer, using the resource links provided in the description. Also, this video is not aimed at Christians, since I believe the Christian bias is far too great to allow a cold, sober look at the facts, and like I've said before, when someone professes to worship the protagonist or the lead character of a story, whether that story is true or not, there is far too much bias and desire for the story to be true, and as such, the worshiper cannot objectively examine the issues. One example that supports this claim of mine, besides the usual intellectually dishonest sites such as tectonics.org, conservapedia.com, theologyweb.com, and countless others, is a website called errantskeptics.org. The title really says it all, doesn't it? The owner, Gary Butner, apparently a doctor of Godology, has created a section that would otherwise be right up our alley in this video if it wasn't for the innate bias and prejudice that inevitably, and with rare exception, follows all Christians to varying degrees, no matter how many degrees follow their name. Let me read the first sentence where Butner tells us that it's more important to surround oneself with opinions that agree with your foregone conclusions than it is to actually look at the evidence. Dating the New Testament based on the opinions of several hundred New Testament scholars. To the random Christian surfing by, this might seem like a cut-and-dried affair. How could hundreds of New Testament scholars who have spent years studying the issues all agree, yet all be wrong? But the sneaky statistic they don't see in that line is that 99% of New Testament scholars are, wait for it, Christians. As I said, someone professing to worship the lead character of a story, someone who feels they owe their very existence to the lead character of that story, simply cannot examine the details of the story, nor the origins of the story itself, in any objective way. But it gets worse. Let's just have a look at the next couple of sentences on that page. In a court of law, the testimony of one expert is often offset by another with a differing opinion. The same thing happens in the academic community as to when the New Testament books were written. However, in the court of public opinion, the testimony of several hundred New Testament scholars far outweighs the opinions of radical scholars, skeptics, and non-believers. We have provided the opinions of several hundred conservative and liberal scholars in the links below to establish the weight of theological opinion against all radical views as to when the New Testament books were written. Here, we see just how willing Butner is to engage the evidence. He automatically dismisses any evidence he doesn't like by poisoning the well. Certainly, any date ranges presented that disagree with his desire to have the writings written as early as possible are just the misinformed ravings of radical scholars or skeptics, unbelievers, and should be dismissed out of hand for they obviously are under the control of Satan and are simply twisting the scriptures in an attempt to cause believers to doubt God's word and to try and turn as many people away from God as possible. So, since that's the case in the good doctor's mind, any claims made by anyone that do not agree with Butner's foregone conclusions must be placed into one of those categories, skeptic, unbeliever, radical scholar, and they must be summarily dismissed. Homeostasis is maintained. Now, I don't want to turn this into a bash the Butner vid, but it is instructive to see the whys and not just the whats. And here, we are seeing a perfect example of why, in general, you cannot go to Christian sites to get the lowdown on the Bible. I will return to Butner's page on the Gospel of Mark once I establish what I feel is a best date range for the Gospel of Mark, but for now, let's actually look at some evidence. Arriving at the most plausible date ranges for all 27 documents of the New Testament, 
is important if you're trying to build a cohesive and unified theory of Christian origins other than that a God came to earth in flesh via human birth, managed to avoid doing anything wrong even when he was two years old, raised more than one person from the dead, among other miracles, died and came back from the dead and bodily floated up through the clouds and into heaven, and has been waiting for almost 2,000 years to return to earth to regenerate billions of dead people whose bodies now no longer exist and snatch the living believers directly up into the clouds. What we need in an excavation of this nature is a truly open and inquisitive mind. A mind that isn't afraid to ask questions such as, Was Mark written before Matthew? Did Matthew copy from Mark's written gospel? Did Luke copy from both Matthew and Mark? Was Matthew an eyewitness to the events? Did Paul write his letters before the first gospel was written? When were the gospels first referred to using the names we now know them by? Did Paul actually write 1 Timothy? When were the writings of the New Testament actually written? These, among others, are crucial questions to be answered if one is to gain a solid understanding of how Christianity formed and evolved during the first two centuries. Let's use the Gospel of Mark as our guinea pig and examine a few concepts involved in arriving at a plausible date range. Where do we start? Well, the title of the video should give you a clue that I'm going to try and supply you with much more than just my opinion about when Mark was written. I'm going to try and walk you through the thought processes and the evidence involved in arriving at that date range. So, we'll start by assuming that we can find this stuff out without asking a so-called expert. I'm not saying that all theologians are way off base, just 99% of them. For those with no vested interest, there is no innate roadblock or taboo conclusions, even against miracles. But again, it's about evidence, not hearsay. And so all of the evidence can be examined and conclusions drawn based on all of the evidence and not just pieces that support the desires of the believer. So let's see if we can dig up some evidence that will help us narrow down Mark's date of authorship. There are two dates that define the range for any writing, and instead of using the Latin verbiage, I will, for clarity's sake, simply call them the upper and lower limits. The upper limit would be the date after which a writing could not have been written. Likewise, the lower limit would be the date before which a writing could not have been written. These dates are hard limits outside of which we would deem authorship impossible. If we can establish these two dates with confidence, we will then have the possible date range for the work, inside which we can further pinpoint the date of authorship and move from possibility to probability. Let's take a look at establishing a good lower limit for the Gospel of Mark. We might start off by asking ourselves, could the Gospel of Mark have been written 10,000 years ago? Of course, this is an absurd question because we know too much for it to sound remotely possible. As we are all aware, the less ignorant we are to begin with, the easier it is for us to dismiss certain propositions as false. For example, if someone were to claim that you can't bend rocks without breaking them, ask them to go look at a video of lava flowing. We all know that Christianity began in the first century, and therefore, a lower limit of 10,000 years ago will not do. Since we know that Christianity began in the first century, and this is backed up by tons of evidence, we can go ahead and bump up the lower limit of Mark to at least the first part of the first century, say, 0 CE. Once again, I am approaching this process from a purely naturalistic standpoint. This means that I'm not going to grant veracity to miracles or prophecies when a we have no verifiable evidence that miracles and prophecies ever occurred, and b. There are much more likely explanations to be had that do not violate facts or physics. Let's see if we can bump up our lower limit a bit more.